a slave. You have seen that film, maybe. Last month, when Steve McQueen, its director, received the Oscar of Best Picture, he declared, I dedicate this award to all the people who have endured slavery and the 21 million people who still suffer slavery today. That surprised you, didn't it? 21 million people. That's three times the population of Switzerland. Do you know who these people are? Where they live? Of course, you've heard of slavery long ago. But according to the International Labour Organization, these 21 million people are enslaved today, now, all over the world, on all continents, in all countries, which means ours. You may think of the women forced into prostitution in our own countries. And you're right. They are part of the 21 million. But do you know that more than two-thirds of these victims work for private employers, private companies in agriculture, fishing, construction, mining, or domestic servitude. We call them victims of forced labor or modern slaves because they have lost their freedom. In the digital age, the chains, iron chains, have been replaced by more subtle ways to deprive freedom. This is what I would like to share with you tonight. How it works. It all starts with recruitment. For us, in that context, recruitment is not the well-known business model most of us have been through freely when looking for a job. It is also the process by which people enter into slavery. And one of them is birth. I met these women in Africa. When she was four or five, she can't remember, she was given as a present to a family by her parents' masters. When I asked her what was her name, she told me, va chercher l'eau. I didn't get it, va chercher l'eau. Go fetch water, that's right. Go fetch water. Her identity reduced to a function like an object. A life of exploitation captured in a name. Elsewhere in the world, recruiters target very poor areas where they know unemployment is high, salaries are low, and people are likely to fall for promises of jobs and attractive wages. This is what happened to Sharon. Sharon, a trained, trained, skilled nurse in her country in Africa. She was promised a job as a carer for an elderly person in the Middle East. So, she borrowed money to pay for a flight ticket, passport, visa. 
but upon arrival, still at the airport, she discovered that she had been sold to a family to work as a domestic. She never wanted to be a domestic. What could she do? She couldn't leave. Her employers had confiscated her passport. She had no legal status. Here she was, indebted, from far from home, no passport, no ways of calling anyone from help. She was trapped. Actually, I met her when she was freed, and I took this picture the very first minute she got her passport back. I chose not to take her face, full of emotion, actually in her face and in mine, but I, I preferred to concentrate on the passport. Passport, something that most of us take from granted, but for others, it can be the bridge from slavery to freedom. Next time you take yours, think about it. A recruiter had abused her trust exactly the same way a recruiter abused Solomon Northup, the main character of 12 Years a Slave. Solomon was promised a job as a violinist and was enslaved in the cotton fields. The same method, fraudulent methods, take place today, 170 years later. Many young women who think they have been recruited to work in the entertainment sector end up forced to prostitute. So you see, deceiving workers, isolating them in a flat or in remote places like deep rainforest, confiscating passport, threatening with violence or threatening to deport the workers, using force are some of the ways employers can deprive workers of their freedom in order to extract more work. But there are more subtle ways. One of them is retention of wages. In the hope of making more money, many skilled workers emigrate for temporary jobs, typically three to six months. Upon arrival, they are told that they will be paid only at the end of their assignment, which means that they won't be able to send the money every month to their family, as they thought. In addition, they are told that uh, food, basic food and lodging will be provided by the employer, and a certain amount, which is not fixed, will be deducted from their pay. Second deception. Six months pass, they have worked, it's now time to go home. But the employer says, if you want to get your pay, you need to work an additional month. And one more, and one more. So you see, in that example, quite classical in construction. No chains, no passport confiscated, no use of violence, just withheld wages. But can a worker who has worked 70 or more hours a week for several months go back home with no wages? The answer is obviously no. The perspective of losing all due wages, the shame of going home empty-handed, is a strong chain as any. Is this happening in only in a hidden place in the kingdom of far, far away? No. The next victim could be your neighbor's domestic worker, locked in a beautiful flat. Or the workers renovating the building next to your business hotel. 
She could also be the little hands assembling our smartphone, harvesting the tea, coffee, cocoa that we drink, or assembling our shirt. So what can we do? What can we do about it? A first step is, could be an is, to pay attention to what we buy. We have the choice. And also to make sure that our governments support the fight again for labor worldwide. As consumers, as citizens, as workers, maybe as employers, we can make a difference in the life of these 21 million people. And this difference is freedom. <laughs> 